Uh, hello guys, my name's Mark Murphy, and today what I'd thought I would do is I would give a short lecture on the basics of Lacanian theory in virtual reality. There's a few reasons why I'm doing this. The first is because I don't have much space in my house. The second is I think that there's something nice about talking about how language constructs our reality whilst being in VR. I mean, you can see, as we see in VR, that I'm in this sort of beautiful constructed space with my friend over here, Bill, and, you know, I can move around. For Lacan, this would be akin to what he would call the imaginary. The code, the code itself, is what creates or creates my perception of reality, how I can, how I, uh, how I can move my hands in reality and how I can, um, how I can see things in virtual reality, sorry. The real is me walking into a wall uh, in reality. So, for instance, if I, if I fall over something in reality and smash everything up, then that's, that's what Lacan would call the real. And this is important because a lot of people sort of put him in the category of postmodernist and doesn't believe anything's real. Lacan believes the real. Lacan believes in... Um, in, in, in hard, solid, real, the real itself. But he doesn't think that the real is reality. Now, I'll, I'll try and ex expand on this a little bit. And you'll have to forgive me if I make a few mistakes about it because I, I can't do any of this from notes or I can't do any of this from slides or any cues. I'm in virtual reality and that means I have a headset on and everything's coming from my poor ruined brain and I I apologize for that and I'm happy if anyone wants to make any corrections or anything please um, send me a message so without further ado I think I'm gonna go inside I don't want this pigeon to fight me so I'm gonna go this way and um, yeah um, so I'll need the rubber or board eraser as the, the Americans call it I think and I shall need at least one pen I don't want the yellow pen because that's rubbish um, so we'll we'll crack on. So a few historical points. I'm going to go. The lecture's going to go. I'm going to give a few historical points. Talk about his Lacan's fascination with Freud and some of the the problems with Freud. I'm going to talk about his linguistic conception of psychoanalysis, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit about his conception of subjectivity uh, and how it's formulated in language. Uh, and then I'm going to leave it there, because being in VR for too long, it gives one a headache, right? It gives one a headache. <clears throat> so the first thing to know is, he was born in Paris, you know, 1901, and he passed away in 1981, okay? And he was known as one of the most, as the most controversial psychoanalyst since Freud. And he's controversial, he was famously expelled from the IPA. Uh, he was rejected by the larger Freudian society. But what, even whilst this happened, he always said that he was remaining true to Freud. Remaining true to Freud. Now, if you know much about Freud or read much of his Freud and you make a synoptic comparison to the writings of Lacan, you can see that it does seem that there's... Um, like how can I put it? Uh, it's very difficult to see a, uh, a, a, sim a similarity between these two things. And this is important because Lacan never ever at any given point wanted to give a fundamentalist interpretation of Freud. I mean, back in the day, uh, American psychology, back in the day, there was a, a, a type of um, received interpretation that was very popular for Freud, from, of Freud. And it was known as Ego psychology. Ego psychology. Forgive me for my handwriting. I'm a little bit dyslexic and I know there's a slight irony in talking about philosophy and psychoanalysis of language whilst in some respects I struggle with language. Maybe there isn't. Maybe that's the, the unconscious reason why I'm so obsessed with it. So, yeah, ego psychology. And what this postulated is it postulated that the job of psychoanalysis was to strengthen the ego or the identity of, of, a, of a patient's uh, psyche whilst repressing and pushing down 
the unconscious. And obviously I'm, I'm bolderizing here, I'm bastardizing, uh, I'm simplifying, and I apologize for that. And this was a received interpretation of Freud. Now, I'm going to make a confession here. I'm not a psychoanalyst. I, I talk with psychoanalysts, I'm friends with psychoanalysts, and I speak to them a lot. And, you know, I'm, my, my whole thing is that I'm, I teach theology and philosophy, and my whole thing is uh, bringing Lacan or Lacanian psychoanalysis into conversation with aspects of pastoral theology. And, and I'm very, because in pastoral theology, there seems to be a, a big focus on Lacan, uh, sorry, a big focus on psychology, but it's very much locked in Jungian, to, Jungian uh, ideologies or Jungian therapies. My whole thing is about introducing Lacan as a serious clinician that can actually help with a lot of the pastoral issues in Catholic pastoral theology. So that's my thing. So I want to talk a little bit about a parallel I, uh, someone else introduced me, Marcus Pound, I think, who talks about, you can see um, a lot of uh, parallels between um, movements in you know, early 20th century theology and Lacan's interpretation of Freud. First, I'm going to introduce another guy, Thomas Aquinas. So Thomas Aquinas, I know that people, why the hell is he talking about scholastic philosophy? Uh, in an argument, in a presentation about a, a weird 20th century um, psychoanalyst. Well, the point is that let me let me explain. Thomas Aquinas is seen as a big doctor of the church, and there's a large received interpretation and a way of reading his 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 ideas. Now, what happened is is that for a long time, people saw this has happened in theology. People stopped reading the actual writings of Aquinas and they became sort of very locked into um, a very rigid interpretation that's an eye for interpretation interpretation of Aquinas and then that interpretation was passed down uh, to the ecclesia or the church okay and that's uh, one of the problems that uh, a certain school of theology called Nouveau Theology or Resourcement Theology tried to address because it argued that what this resulted in is a type of separation between nature and grace. Okay? Nature and grace. When certain theologians, uh, it's very French for the theologian, I'm not going to give all their names right now, argued that if you actually get rid of this received interpretation, right? And you just go directly to Aquinas and read what he's saying. You realize that this separation between nature and grace is, is vanished. Not because of some wonderful interpretation, but because it's much richer and more complicated than what we think it is. And the reason why this separation has happened between nature and grace is because we've simplified the teachings of Aquinas. Now... You're wondering why I've gone off on this sort of tangent in, in virtual reality to talk about this, but you see this with Lacan's return to Freud. And as I've talked about, he talks about the return to Freud. What he wants is he wants people to return to the writings of Freud, not to give a fundamentalist interpretation, but to, to rediscover the radicalness of his discovery of the unconscious and to to keep the richness and complexity of that discovery without reducing it. And Lacan, much like we see with Aquinas and others, is that this separation between the conscious and the unconscious starts to dissipate, or rather it becomes much more complicated. We can see one and the other, and, and the other, and the other side, and, and it becomes much more complicated than what we first imagined. So complicated, in fact, that Lacan argues that the best way to understand the unconscious is not by this received interpretation that you see with, with uh, the previous um, ego psychologists. He says that the, the, instead of saying that the unconscious is a type of sea of instincts and libidinal drives and just to do with feelings, these sort of pre-linguistic things that are buried deep with inside of us. He says that the unconscious is structured, structured 
like a language. Now, I want to make another slight detour for a moment because this is important because Lacan's whole idea is that about complicating the unconscious or our conception of, of, our, of the unconscious. One of the problems that we found in psychology and you know this is a problem that we still today because we still use the term unconscious I did this unconsciously I was unconscious when I did this or yeah you know, sorry that's the same thing but you know uh, we speak we use the um, the term the unconscious and we use it a lot it's something that we still use in language today but the problem for psychology and so this imagine if this is a person's head I'm gonna draw Homer Simpson all right there's Homer okay because I'm not very good at drawing and just say he goes to psychoanalysis uh, and he, you know, the whole idea of psychoanalysis is to discover the unconscious. Then we have to ask questions about the ostensive definition of the unconscious. What is it? Certain psychoanalysis mirrors a lot uh, of the arguments that you see with Cartesianism about um, where's the seat of the soul? Where is the self? Where's the Cartesian I? Where does it exist? You know, Descartes famously said that it exists in this strange thing called the pineal gland. You see a sort of repetition with that with, unco with, uh, with psychoanalysis. The unconscious, where is it? What is it? People so, so just imagine that this is the mind. You know, we imagine that the unconscious is sort of buried somewhere in the brain as, you know, a little black box of evil secrets that we need to unlock and connect up with the mind again. And obviously, with modern neurology and whatnot, we realize that this doesn't exist and this lead led to various forms of therapy that are invented that have just thrown away the unconscious you know it's it's a fugazi it doesn't exist it's not real so what Lacan did and obviously what th this this idea that we can reach into the mind and find the categories of our thought or the principles which make us us was a problem that was hit by a lot of linguistic philosophers so if in the past, people like Immanuel Kant argued that the way we understand reality is through a type of a priori framework. This is an a priori framework. Yes, I'm drawing an a priori framework. The categories by which I can understand reality. And that's mediated through these categories. And that leads to knowledge. Okay, that leads to knowledge. The problem with the linguistic philosophers is they realize that you can't really talk about these, uh, the limits of thought. How do you do that? I can't pull the framework out of my head and look at it. So what they did is they realized a lot of these puzzles in philosophy are, uh, are actually linguistic puzzles. If I want to know what the limits of my thought are, it's about tracing the limits of language. This is known as the linguistic turn in philosophy. Um, and it was something that was shared by both the analytic tradition. So people like Wittgenstein, Frege, Frege um, Bertrand Russell, all others, they became very focused on tracing the limits of language, or looking at what is it possible for us to say in language rather than talking about what is it possible to know. Whilst in the f continental tradition, it became much more focused on how language shapes us as human beings and I'll talk about that a little bit more because Lacan's very much in that latter category although he does actually engage with analytic philosophy and I think that there should be more studies regarding that his conception of uh, sexuation you know famously is, is in um, works by examining modal logic in a very idiosyncratic fashion but I digress and I have digressed if Wittgenstein tells us that the limits of the limits of my world is the limits of my language, Lacan very much located in this by arguing that uh, the unconscious is structured like a language. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about how Lacan sees the unconscious as a type of stru linguistic structure and how, as human beings, we come to form our identity, consciousness, and as opposed to the unconscious, as a in slow, traumatic integration into language itself. Now, I start, start and if I miss anything else, I apologize.
trying my best here, but uh, you know, trying to speak from without any notes is, is a difficult thing to do. So, if this represents me uh, prior to language, Lacan argues that we come into this world uh, with no consciousness almost. We, we come in as a type of pre-linguistic, disorganized box of, of sensation. He calls this polymorphous perversity, borrowing the term from Freud. This represents chaos, you know, the chaos of pure sensation. There's no distinction uh, I can make between myself and the mother. I can't organize myself. There are no categories of thought. There is just pure libidinal enjoyment or sensation, jouissance, a primary and jouissance. And what Lacan says is that as we come into the world, the world where there are other speaking beings, the world's about my mother, my father, this is that Lacan says we, we, we form our first sense of self or the formative I through our first confront, confrontation with ourselves in a mirror and with you know, the oracular drive. We see ourselves and usually, and then we interject that image onto ourselves. And that image, the imago, uh, dissipates the chaos. It allows us, some of the chaos, sorry, it allows us to be able to get a preliminary sense of self, organize the self. And this allows us our first stepping stone into the world of language okay so this represents introjection and the mirror stage and this is usually done the, the image is usually presented by uh, the mother you know the uh, the mother one that shows the, uh, the child and shows the, the, uh, the image of the child in the mirror the mother usually does this Lacan says that this stage is typified by unity. I can I conflate this image with myself, and when I realise that this image isn't myself, or it doesn't quite fit with my body, you know, because it is different, then the, it then aggressivity formulates. And Lacan calls this stage the mirror stage, but also calls it the imaginary stage. And it's important to think, you know, when he talks about this, I represent imaginary. Is that you know the tendency to think of this in dialectical terms? The idea that this phase will f go away completely, and then we move on to the next de developmental stage, and then the next, as if it's like a progressive hierarchy. And Lacan's no says no, that's not the case. Th this imaginary thing it plays an important part, an important psychological part of our identity. It insists or subsists, and it carries on right the way through. So this is the imaginary phase. Now it's important to know that as <coughs> As what's it called? I'm introduced into this field, this this uh, this uh, into the world. Sorry, and I go through the mirror stage. There's something else going on in the background, okay? And that's I am introduced into this world of language. Okay, this S represents signifier. I will talk about the relation between signifier and signified in a moment, but just for now. This represents language. Language as a system that rumbles away in the background whilst I'm in the mirror stage. It's a system that I know or I experience as a young child as loaded with meaning, but I cannot understand it. Okay? I, all these broken bits of language, these partial s sounds, these noises, it's around me all the time. Okay? Are you with me so far? So language represents a type of, like a type of field or fabric that I've introduced to, and then in that field, the imaginary stage happens. Okay. Language is there as a type of system, and a way to be able to understand that, I suppose it's like Egyptian hieroglyphs. They were discovered. We knew that they represented meaning or the meaning of a lost culture, but we could never understand them, not for a long time until we found the appropriate keys to unlock the language. And then we could make connection between these symbols and create stories from them. Okay, it's important to remember because that's what it's like. And I remember very succinctly as a very young child, um, and it's important to know that Lacan, th in this imaginary stage, he calls it a proto-symbolic. We can still use language, but we use it in a very simplistic way, in a very literalist way. And I remember having conversations with my mother 
having simple conversations and I could understand her. But when she went away and spoke to other adults and was using this complex system that was prohibited to me, I, could, I remember f- having this feeling of anxiety, intense anxiety that they were talking about me or talking about something important. And I didn't know what it was, but I needed to know. And I think that that's representative of, of, what, of the first stage, the imaginary stage. The world for the young child is their image and the body of the mother. And so far, that uh, the body of the mother is what the child is pulled away from initially when uh, it was well, sort of separated from slightly in the first process of the imaginary phase. Okay, so I've, I've used the term signified and signify, and I want to talk a little bit about that at the moment because it's important to know. So he takes these terms signified and signifier from an, a, a famous semiotician, semiotician, one Ferdinand Saucer. And I'm not going to go too much into his theory because it, you can run an entire course on what he was talking about. But for now, what I want to talk about is his conception of signified and signifier. This represents signifier and this represents, sorry, I'm in a dyslexic moment there. This represents signified. Now the signifier is the sound or the noise or the word we use to represent a thing in reality. Okay? A thing in reality. We use the word chair to represent this thing in reality. We call a chair. What um, I'm not going to go because he does talk about uh, signifiers being the, uh, it, meaning is only generated from an interlinking chain of difference. I'm not going to talk about all that, but the main thing here is that what Saussure said is that there's an equivalence between uh, the signified and the signifier. Lacan inverts this, you know, like he does. And you have to remember that he's talking about psychological realities. He's talking about psychological realities, not trying to come up with a completely coherent theory of language. He's talking about clinical experience. It's always important to keep that in mind. So what Lacan does, rather than having an equivalency between the signifier and signified, Lacan says that the signifier is primary and the signified always slides under the signified. And what this means is it means that the system of language that you see here as a meaningless system that's made up of pure interlinking chains, uh, chains of sign- words that are linked together constantly, perpetually, that chain as a type of me- as, a, as a type of system where meaning is initially prohibited from me, but, ne- but then eventually becomes meaningful, which I'll explain a little bit, that signifier, the sounds, the words, the sounds themselves, that's what creates our sense of reality. And that sounds really, really odd. So how do sounds or words by themselves without reference to anything, how can that create our sense of reality? Well, I'll explain that now, okay? I'll explain this now. So what Lacan says, I keep dropping these pens, they're not very, I'm using these controllers, but uh, it's, it's not, they're not very good for holding pens, and I, I apologize for that. So I don't want the green pen. I want this black. This is a good, nice little black pen. Okay, so what Lacan says is that if we come into the world and we're in the, the imaginary phase, remember the imaginary phase, dyadic relationship with the mother, in order to be able to be introduced into the language proper and to use the field to be introduced into this field of language that's prohibited to me, to be able to understand the hieroglyphs, if you wish. Something needs to happen. So here's the father. What Lacan says is that a sound or a word that only references itself stabilizes or introduces a type of self-referential law upon which allows the chain of signifiers to stabilize itself and then from that we can create meaning. So what Lacan says is that the no of the father, or this is complicated, the no or the name, ne- name and no are homonyms in, in France, name of the father. 
This cuts off, this law, this primary law cuts off uh, the child from the enjoyment of the body. Synonymous, it basically allows the child to be separated from the pleasure principle and introduced to the reality principle, if you want to use Freudian terms. And then from this, this first signifier, forgive me, from this first signifier, this no, and Lacan has a mathematical term for this, M1, okay, because of M1, the master signifier, this one signifier allows a type of uh, suturing, so it's like a, like a suture. And then, if we were talking about that, that uh, f sea of signifiers that we couldn't understand, those partial bits of conversation, those noises, those sounds, it allows us to be able to create a linking chain, a linking chain which creates our initial life story. Lacan says, Father gives us a name. And then that name it allows us to be part of that signifying chain. Okay? I'm sorry, I'm not very good at drawing. So this is what Lacan said. Now, the problem with, Lacan, with what Lacan says is that this chain goes on forever. Now, Lacan says that, you know, when I have, a, uh, for instance, the name of an ob... Famously, sorry, um, as an ob object, the, the, going back to Aquinas, is that he believed that if you know something... If you know something, like, so say, if I know a book, then at, the, at, a, at an intellectual level, then that becomes part of me, you know, an intellectual formal level. And, you know, become, the object is in me somehow at an intellectual level. I know its essence, so to speak. You know, Lacan being the linguistic philosopher that he was, you know, but no, when we, when we know something like book, or table, or chair, or whatever, we don't have the thing in our head. We have... A word and that word only that single word only gets meaning from its reference to another word and that mi word gets its reference to another another word and so on and so on and so on and so on Lacan says that this chain goes on forever and the reason why it goes on forever is it because it's because it's chasing a type of lost object the final object that can bring perpetual satisfaction this lost object is what makes is the the cut off primal enjoyment that was uh, cut off from us from our initial entry into language. So Lacan says, well, how how can this be? How can we stabilize this 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 uh, these chain of signifiers? How can we you know get meaning? Or in you know using sources, term, how can we move from the realm of the signifier to the realm of the signified? Signified for Lacan is the realm of meaning, and this realm here is the realm of that which uh, structures meaning. It's meaning in potentia. This is the realm of the unconscious. This is the realm of consciousness. Meaning is the realm of the signified, and meaning is the realm of the ego, and meaning is the realm of consciousness per se. Right. So, so what Lacan says, and I thank uh, the wonderful philosopher... Uh, Todd McGowan for this wonderful exposition I'm about to give. You know, it's not my work; it's his work, and I fully recommend you watch his videos, especially on Lacan and subjectification. I also want to give a shout out to my friend Michael Downs, who's written a wonderful post, a fantastic post. He's on um, the Squid Game and the Theory of Desire. Gives one of the best expositions on Lacan and subjectivity and desire. Well worth reading. Thank you very much. So, um, Lacan says we have master signifiers, and the master signifiers is what allows us entry into language, and it allows us to stabilize language. The problem, and you know, we find master signifiers all around us. Uh, things like God. You know, God is a famous master signifier. Todd McGowan says, you know, God, I am what I am. But we also find it in sort of uh, deontological statements. We should do duty. Why? Because it's right to do one's duty. You know, we can see that Kant is very much uh, a creature of master signifiers, especially when talking about the categorical imperative. The problem is that when... The problem is with these master signifiers is that they're always self-referential. They're tautologies. And because they're tautologies, if we look at them closely enough, we see that they're impotent. 
okay? I think the famous example of you know, pure impotence is you know, the ontological argument for the existence of God. The ontological argument famously argues that, um, that one of the predicates of God, one of the predicates of God, being the perfect being that he is, must be existence. And if existence is a predicate of God, then therefore he must exist. Because if I imagine a being that, is, uh, that doesn't have existence, then it cannot be perfect. Hence, God must exist. Uh, another way of saying it, if God, is, God exists, then it's necessary that God exists. If it's necessary that God exists, then therefore God must exist. Yes, you can say it works in logic. Fine, whatever. But really, we know it's a tautology, because no one's really convinced by it. And this is what Lacan means when he says that there is no binary signifier. And if we, you know, an, uh, another master signifier that can close off uh, or complete or take away the impotence of this master signifier, to take away the self-authority of it. There's no way of closing it off and make sense of it. So, uh, and so what happens, you know, is that because there is no correlating M2, we need something else to fill in the void. And the void, according to Todd McGowan, is knowledge, or the chain of secondary signif sorry, the chain of, uh, the chain of signifiers that we mentioned before. And this is always contingent. So God is love, God is something, God is whatever. You know, you can come up with any explanation to, uh, to add as a type of contingent accidental quality of a master signifier. And it can go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, constantly chasing, as I said before, the lost object. Following me so far? It's a bit weird, but you know, it's, once you get to grips and understand it, it sort of makes sense. Okay, and I apologize if I'm bastardizing anything here. I'm trying my best. So, you know, we're constantly chasing this lost object in language. And so what Lacan says is that, that, you know, we spoke about the imaginary phase as its type of insistence, is that that still operates. And he talks about how language stabilizes itself by punctuating, by punctuating, we add a full stop. You know, it doesn't actually mean a real full stop. He's talking about it in terms of psychological realities. And this full stop allows us to imagine that whatever knowledge we have completes M1, or it hides the impotence of M1, if you wish. He calls it the point de capiton. The point de capiton. And he set it like a button tie. And what it happens is, is that this full stop, uh, it works at the insistence of the imaginary. It allows us to imagine um, meaning being closed off. So um, the sentence only gets its meaning by the full stop through the point de capiton. And meaning is retroactively thrown back. And you can give so God is love, and uh, love is God, full stop. And you can, you can, uh, you can, that becomes meaningful. And it's a type of knowledge. And it allows us to be able to imagine that the master signifier stabilizes our life world. So this is what Lacan talks about. You know, this is his conception of the unconscious. The conscious, consciousness is at the level of the imaginary. And it's the coherent life story. It's the coherent life story that we tell ourselves. All that knowledge that we tie to, to the master signifier. All that knowledge that we tie to the master signifier, right? Problem is, is that for Lacan, language is a type of precar precarious thing. It's like ill-fitting clothes. It always leaves something out. That thing that we're chasing, the A is representative of that primordial enjoyment that was cut off from the body. That's always in the background. And Lacan calls this, this aspect the real. Language coats the real, if you wish, or the real of the body. And all those other signifiers, you know, they're all here, those lost stories, those things that we don't want to know about ourselves, those stories that could have never been, partial conversations, they rumble away in the background. And they link up, they link up, and they, they, they condense with one another, and they change around, 
And Lacan famously says that uh, you know, there's expositions where in psycho, you know, clinical experience, you can have people who recount a certain traumatic experience but don't feel it. it they don't feel it, okay? They don't feel uh, or the effect that should come with a terrible story. Instead, what happens is that the effect has become locked onto a repressed signifier. And that repressed signifier, or which it comes back and interrupts our story as a symptom. You know, and the whole point of Lacanian analysis is to link up these repressed, uh, effect-laden, lost signifiers, or s signifiers that have become uh, loaded with the effect of, us, of that was, should be proper to our story, and to integrate them back into, into the story. You know, the whole, that's one, one interpretation of analysis. Don't forget, I'm only giving a very specific interpretation of a specific moment in Lacanian theory. It, much, it gets much more complicated, and Lacan changes and revises his position. And so what I'm saying here is just a stepping stone. And not even that, it's, some of it's probably a bit wrong. You know, I'm just trying my best here. I don't have my notes in front of me. So... This is what uh, Lacan's theory of subjectivity is, and what his idea of design is. I suppose we look, say, to say the unconscious is structured like a language. What does it mean? It means, it means that we need to approach the unconscious as if it's deep, as complicated as we are. We can't simplify it, and we should approach it with all the complexity as if we would approach a language. No one would say that they fully understand a language because a language is too big. The same way as you wouldn't say, I understand New York City. It's just too big. You can say you understand an aspect of it or a certain part of the life that's in there, but you would not say that you understand all of it. And it also means that if, if it's complex and it's like a language, it means that you should approach the unconscious with this idea of listening to it as if it was a type of... Um, it means approaching it with this idea of listening carefully. Constantly listening carefully, constant interpretation, decoding and ciphering. And I just want to read something here because it's from a new book that's just come out called Lacanian Analysis in Practice. And it's wonderful gives such a great exposition on what Lacanian analysis is, it, sorry, uh, in, in practice. And it's well worth getting. It's just come out. And uh, this I want, cause it allows me to be able to finish on a point on, on the practicalities of what this weird anthropology is about. And he says this, when listening to a patient, the most important and at the same time, the most difficult thing to do is to follow to the letter what is being said. This means paying extra careful attention to the patient's words. Stick to the exact signifiers uttered. Avoid using synonyms and avoid referring to what one imagines the speaker intended to say. Analytic listening does not take place on the level of sense or meaning that we imagine, but by placing one letter after another one signifier after another, as is done when solving a puzzle. It is precisely the choice of words that informs us about one's unconscious desire. That, this, is the essential aspect of li analytic listening. And it is surprising that this is not commonly practiced in the psychological world. It is also surprising how many therapists pay very little attention to the terms adopted by their patients, not realizing how their speech, narration, or life story clearly revolves around some specific signifiers. I think that's a wonderful exposition on what Lacanian analysis is about. And I think, you know, I'll go outside now. It's, um, I think, you know, we always have to remember that Lacan, at the end of the day, was an analyst. And he said his main goal was always about training analysts. However, what he wanted to do is he wanted to be able to challenge the oversimplification 
of Freud. He wanted to challenge the oversimplification of Freud. And to do that, he reached to the cultural signifiers and elements that were around him at the time. Because he wanted to reinter he wanted to return to the radical discovery of the unconscious. Unfortunately, what this meant or what, it ha what meant to happen is that what it mean what sorry what it me meant to happen what what this resulted in sorry is that he took a lot of philosophy, very complicated philosophy, and complicated Freud through that, using philosophy, difficult philosophy, difficult ideas, to interpret what Freud meant, to challenge that overly simplistic idea. Unfortunately, what this meant is it annoyed and made lots of psychoanalysts hate him because of that complexity. On the other hand, what it meant is that lots and lots of philosophers started to read Lacan and started having problems with Lacan because they believed it challenged the, the, their philosophical edifice or their commonly held assumptions about the subject. So you have this reality where psychoanalysts hate him because he's overcomplicated Freud through philosophy. And they, and then you have philosophers who hate it because he, that he's Freudianizing philosophical ideas. This is, the, there is, this is the problem with a lot of Lacanian ideals. There's also a question, as I said before, I think, um, about his writings. Lacan, as Marcus Pound teaches us, he's, he's, he, he, was, he was a great writer, but he wasn't a great writer because he didn't write much. He wrote a few books, a few papers here and there for delivery, which were collected and put together as, it, as his acli and his other acli, or utter acli. Forgive me for my French, I'm from Liverpool, I will mash it and destroy it. And um, so what his main teachings come from were from his seminars, which is essentially an oral tradition, a speaking tradition. And what was spoken there and how it was spoken to the audience, the context, some of what, what that was said was, is ultimately going to be um, going to be missing in the transcriptions. And so there has to be a type of hermeneutic sensitivity to those writings and reading them as if you are imagining you are being spoken to. Because at the end of the day, psychoanalysis, it is a body of theory. And, the, you know, we can have all the meta-psychology and whatnot. But ultimately, the training of analysis isn't, isn't received through a body of knowledge. It's received as a practice of listening and speaking. And that's really important to remember when approaching uh, the difficulty of Lacan's writings. Anyway, I, I hope that maybe this video hasn't been too successful. But I want to say thank you very much for, uh, for listening to what I have to say. And hopefully, if, you know, in the future, I can make a few more videos. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm Mark Murphy, and I hope to see you all again. Goodbye.